to you. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, when I was uh, asked to do this uh, session, I started thinking about my relationship with the subject of climate change and air pollution and when, when that relationship started. And I was thinking back and uh, I hit upon the subject of my undergraduate uh, dissertation, uh, the title of which is uh, on the slide. And I wrote this in March, 1991. And the dissertation was about sulfur dioxide emissions specifically. But regardless, it is a concern to me that an undergraduate today could write pretty much the same thing nearly 30 years later about climate change. Further sobering thought here is the time scale, 30 years. I don't think I, you know, how could I have been sort of, you know, in my professional life for that long? Climate change impacts are often measured in decades. And we think we've got time to act, but it won't affect us in our lifetime. Time passes really quickly. And if anything, that, what I refer to green awareness, you know, has become greenwashing. And it's even more of a thing today. I think there is a just definite you know, consensus has formed that climate change is real. It's happening just as scientists predicted over many, many years. The debates over the level of risk and the impact it's going to have still rage. But we're health and safety practitioners, aren't we, most of us? We relish risk and we relish uncertainty, don't we? It's what we're all about. One of my favourite quotes came out about 19... Uh, sorry... 2020, I think at the uh, at the beginning of, um, of the COVID pandemic, I think it was attributed to somebody uh, in the States. And they said, we will never know if we overreacted, but it will become very obvious very soon if we underreact. I think that's really applicable to what we're doing at the moment with climate change. So we fast forward to February 2022, Recently in the UK, we've had storms Dudley and Eunice, apparently the worst for 15 years. But what happens if these events are every five years or even every year? So I started asking myself, what would that mean for workers safely? And I'm going to concentrate on workers safely uh, with this afternoon session, but we will touch a little bit on, uh, on third party public liability as well. And I was driving along in the aftermath of these storms. And I thought about the people who were attending utility breakdowns. I thought about property damage and construction workers having to go out to site, possibly to you know, unstable structures. I thought about transport disruption events, the increased use of mobile plant, access equipment, working at height, power tools. I thought about people working more frequently in extreme weather conditions, yeah, particularly those workers who are first responders, but also people who drive for a living. Yeah, how many of the bridges that were closed to high-sided vehicles, possibly meaning extra hours. So, so many, so many potential impacts. So, as I said, this presentation concentrates on safety, health and environmental impacts of climate change. And I've included air pollution because it's my presentation and I can. There's other impacts, of course, but we can't put everything in there. Second point is I'm going to consider risk and liabilities rather than duties under the environment or health and safety legislation, though, of course, there is some crossover. I'm going to run through some of the climate change impacts that I believe will have some sort of impact on worker or third party health or safety, potentially on the environment as well, and where a liability may attach to either the employer, the landlord, uh, or the occupier of the land or assets. It's not all doom and gloom. It would be remiss of me to not mention that there may be opportunities to be realised that will benefit you, me, individuals, families, employers, and society as a whole. For example, we only need to consider the impact on air quality from reduced transport and industrial emissions following COVID-19 lockdown. And finally, towards the end, I'll run through some of the tools and guidance out there that may be of use to you in assessing and mitigating the risks that you're responsible for managing. Before I start, I'd like to know a little bit about you guys. 
Uh, so a few questions in a poll. So Liz, if you wouldn't mind, <clears throat> could you post the, uh, the poll up? Just a couple of questions about your uh, sort of relationship with um, climate change and air pollution. So if you just spend a few seconds just uh, completing those, please. Let's give it up to two minutes, perhaps, Liz. Yeah, no problem. I can take the top. We've had 17%, so 74% have voted. Mm -hmm. Get your votes in. I'll close it in three, two, one. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I and mean, I think the thing for me, you know, bear in mind the subject of, of this of this uh, this session is that last question about whether if you have got plans, whether they include an in, uh, an assessment of impact on worker safely safety. Um, Sixty one percent. Yeah, so it's not that high. And I, it, you know, it's my sort of my sort of sense that it often does get forgotten about. Yeah, we think about you know all the other things around climate change, but we forget that every time you know there's a fire or a flood or a windstorm, yeah, you know, somebody's dealing with that, somebody's recovering from that, and that's that's humans, and that's what we're all about, isn't it? It's it's trying to keep those people health healthy and safe. So you know that was part of the reason for for me getting interested in this in the first place. So thanks everybody for your uh, for sharing that. So on the slide, there's a little bit of uh, information. There's plenty of uh, of that out there. There's a lot of numbers with with climate change. Uh, a lot of infographics. Um, I can sometimes find that a little bit hard to relate to. I find, and, and it's perhaps just me, but I need to relate things at a personal level for them to be sort of impactful to me and give it some meaning. So you know that first bit about internationally protected intertidal habitats. I must confess, in my spare time one of my hobbies is a bit of bird watching so for me you know that number a little picture of a wader so what but if i think about actually going walking along the beach yeah an estuary something like that and it being devoid of thousands of water birds waterfowl waders yeah and their calls yeah that looked pretty uninspiring yeah that 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 bothers me coastal erosion how are people in the communities going to feel when they're told that the shoreline management plan won't be implemented and their homes are at risk. I went on holiday to uh, near a small village in Wales a couple of years ago, and that was exactly the situation they're facing. They've been told that their um, protection against uh, the sea will not be repaired. They know that their village, their homes, have got a limited lifespan. How are they going to feel about that? Abandoned, uncared for, bitter? Yeah, and this is some of the context that we need to be thinking about, in my view. There was a heat wave in the UK uh, and Northwest Europe in 2003 in, in Kent. It hit 38 and a half degrees. 
deaths. It caused the deaths of around 2,000 people in the UK. In France, it was 15,000 people. Many were elderly. They died of dehydration in the excessive heat. I remember it well. I'd, um, I'd taken our eight, my eight-month-old daughter with my wife camping uh, in Normandy. We drove around. We looked for castles to hide in because they had nice, thick, cool walls. We had the air conditioning on in the car. And it's the only holiday I've ever come home from because it was too hot. It wasn't a lot cooler in England, but at least we weren't in a tent trying to keep a newborn baby cool and not getting sunburned. And that's just a holiday. You know, that was my choice. And, you know, I could do something about that. But th think about your work. You know, think about if you work in the rail industry, as shown in the photograph there, or the healthcare settings shown in the images. And we hear this, don't we? If we get a really, you know, a hot spell, the railway tracks start to buckle. And yeah, that's nothing new. But now they're buckling more often, maybe more severely over a wider geographic area on the network. Services are disrupted, cancelled or slowed down. Passengers are going to get fraud. Your staff have to deal with those frustrated customers whilst dealing with the heat of an office themselves or working outside. You've got to recruit more people to your maintenance teams. They're all going to need induction, training, equipment. You need more supervisors, managers for them. The dish is actually working on the track of harsh. The sun's more intense. The gangs need more water, more frequent rest. You need to review, re-procure the type of kit they're wearing so that they can stay cooler and protected from the sun. You have new technology introduced to monitor weather, heat, track conditions, air pollution. That needs new communication technology and training both for you and the people using it. In healthcare, Maybe a scenario here, the heat wave strikes at the same time as a new virus begins to run out of control. You never know, it could happen. Most patients are already vulnerable because of age and medical conditions. On top of that, they're now dehydrating and weak. You're involved with the setup, commissioning, running of a temporary hospital in an exhibition centre. You need to liaise with the armed forces, work out lines of management, responsibility and communication. Face masks and RPE were, were uncomfortable to wear in a typical summer, now need to be changed to a new type just so people can continue with their work. Then you find out the Americans have bought it in. In all workplaces, we're concerned and anxious for loved ones and ourselves. The heat's making us short tempered, our sleep patterns are disturbed. If you think about human factors, behavioural safety, we start making more mistakes. We forget things. We take shortcuts, incidents that are not necessarily directly related to climate change or the heat start to increase. The things that we do every day become more dangerous. And at that point, supplies start to run out. And that, my friends, is when the trouble really starts. So listen, a second key point really is that clim climate change is interdisciplinary. If you don't already, yeah, do start raising awareness of how climate change may impact the organisation and how other professions can contribute to start thinking about worker safety and safety of your customers, guests, visitors, contractors, third parties. And start building those relationships with human resources, learning and development, emergency planning, insurance, and risks teams. So every few years, um, Her Majesty's Government release climate change risk assessment. The new one's come out. I haven't had a chance to, uh, to update it. This is the last one in 2017, and it's a fairly typical risk matrix that, uh, that we're all going to be pretty familiar with. But it's, uh, it's trying to capture the fact that climate change is dynamic. And unless further action is taken, its impact and the associated risks are only going to get worse. We know this. Doing nothing is not. So what are some of the key points from the table? I'm speaking to you now as, as health and safety professionals. If this was a conventional safety, health or environmental assessment, I'd put it to you all that you wouldn't accept it. You wouldn't want to be part of a risk that you knew was just going to get worse. It's going to cause more illness, more injury, more environmental damage, not to mention the associated business loss that is going to come from lower productivity, scarcity of raw materials or energy, supply chain disruption, enforcement action and reputational damage. 
If this was a deteriorating safety situation, I think you'd be doing all you could, all in your power to influence the decision makers in your employers into taking the necessary action, not just now. And a lot of this is going to be medium long term. The text on the right hand side is um, an attempt to, on my part to try and sort of articulate some of the liability issues that are associated with climate change. Um, and as I move through the various yes, climate change hazards that I'm going to speak about, uh, that will become uh, a little bit more obvious. Some, um, it seems pretty clear, there could be a potential either employers or public liability uh, angle. Some, it's a little bit more, um, more unlikely. But we'll include that as well as looking at the hazards and the risks. So the next few slides, we're going to look at what I think are some of the most significant climate change impacts. What I think the risks to health and safety are going to be from those impacts and what the liability issues are going to be. Each slide tries to capture the key issues. I won't read through all of them. Now you can do that and ask questions later if you would, as Liz said. Just pop them in the um, in the chat as we go and then we'll pick them up at the end again i'll try and introduce a little bit of data a few case studies examples um but for now let's have a, a quick refresh on you know is this on everybody's radar the little poll showed you know probably the majority really small majority have got plans in place so let's have a quick look at what that means for business uh, at the moment so this is what the International Underwriting Association had to say uh, in the new year. And that last line is you know, pretty telling, isn't it? Yeah, the change from, from four years. Yeah, or over over the course of four years. Uh, Zurich are co-sponsors of the World Economic Forum's Global Risk um, Perception Survey. So this is uh, the results from, from this year. So moving from left to right, the short term, medium term uh, and long term. So these are all threats. These are not these are not picked out to be sustainability or climate change. But clearly, you can see that most of those, most of what we're talking about today, will probably fall into the environmental bracket. Yeah, so extreme weather events as the short term switching to climate change uh, action failure uh, over the medium and long term. But extreme weather still stays in that high level. So the first of the risks I'm going to look at is water, okay? Uh, we can have too much of it, we can have too little of it, and it can be of the wrong kind. So hopefully this makes sense because the other slides are going to do the same thing. So the impact, and, and most of that's you know, generally you know, pretty, pretty well accepted now. And I've tried to interpret that in terms of risks to people, whether they be, be employees, workers, or uh, contractors, third parties, public uh, service users, guests, and all the rest of it. And then my view on what the liability angles might be. So a few little bits of sort of data just to sort of bring, bring this to life a little bit. Many regional fire and rescue services in the UK are attending more flood events than fire events now. Matt Rapp, the General Secretary of the Fire Brigade Union, said we've seen an increase in flooding incidents linked likely to the mass flooding emergencies across the country in, in the last winter. Widespread flooding in the last year and recent wildfires have shown that firefighters are battling the sharp end of climate change. Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service was called to 15,247 incidents last year. In total, fires made up just 25% of those. The impact of climate change on water resources is usually the most cited in, as a risk in the UK from climate change, as, as, as you've just seen. 
it's usually expressed as a risk to property and other assets. But as I said at the beginning, you know, we need to think about there's always people involved. There's people occupying the buildings, there's people responding to it, there's people cleaning up. Yeah. So the National Flood Risk Assessment identified that 55% of water pumping and treatment stations are in floodplains. 20% of railway tracks are in floodplains. 14% of electricity infrastructure, 9% of healthcare, 7% of hospitals and schools. Yeah. So if you work, if your if your business is associated with any of those things, then I think it's time to be thinking about those if you're not already. I'll just mention, I won't do this for everyone because there's a similar pattern for most of these things. On the liability thing, I break it down into work, a third party and environment because they tend to be the different insurance policies that most commercial organisations will, will have in place. So for workers, it's likely if harm is caused, you're in the work. Yeah, the risks are foreseeable, clearly. You know, these things, you know, exactly when they happen might not be predictable, but it's pretty foreseeable as to whether they will or not at some point. Good practice is established for mitigation. Yeah, we do know how to keep people safe when they're working in and around water. The part, it's likely if causation can be established where a duty of care is owed. Yeah, so if it's your business's responsibility to keep the water out of people's houses, yeah, or maybe you've done something that is then facilitated what to get into houses, homes, premises, commercial businesses, then is the possibility of third party claims sticking. Environment, yeah, quite likely there because unlike health and safety, we've got strict liability in place for environmental legislation. So that's the first one, water, too much, too little, and the wrong kind. So a quick example, um, you know, in the last couple of years, Again, this was sort of billed mainly as a supply chain disruption issue. But, you know, we need to think about, well, that freight is still going to need to be moved. So it's going to go to road or it's going to go to rail, typically. So therefore, we've got more vehicle movements. We've got more traffic on the roads. We've got more traffic on the rail. All of that needs timetabling, scheduling, drivers are needed, crews, et cetera, et cetera. If that's one of your barges on the thing, then there's a potential additional work for rescue and recovery crews. So again, just thinking about these things in terms of human health and safety. Wildfires. So 2019, the UK had nearly 100 wildfires burning over 16,000 hectares uh, of land. 2018, slightly fewer, but a greater burned area. Most of the damage is confined to the countryside, but this is in stark comparison to California, where it seems like pretty much every year in Australia more recently as well, where so many homes have been destroyed and lives lost. Some fires are started naturally, but many are due to human carelessness and arson, and we'll come on to the liability um, example in a sec. This has led to new laws or bylaws being created, large scale news coverage and information campaigns. Does this mean additional resources are needed for community liaison or even policing those policies? Yeah, for every action, there's going to be a reaction that might have safety implications. So, you know, think about, you know, if this is meaningful to your business, what's your plan for fighting wildfires? Because they're not the same as tackling a building fire. What would the fire service do? Yeah, do you let it burn? Do you just let it burn itself out? Do you tackle it? Are your workers, are your assets, are your neighbours at risk? And to what degree? The operational risk assessments and operational standard operating procedures reflect the specific nature of fighting wildfires. And do you have the right equipment for training? So this is a news article uh, in the aftermath of the 2018 fires in, in California. So there are 86 fatalities and 15,000 homes destroyed. Obviously, there was a loss of power. There was an emergency response by the utility companies, by the emergency services. And then if we think further on from that, there's going to be impact on health and social services from people who have been displaced from this. And just note, you know, the angle of this, of the news article here, 
basically potentially ruinous lawsuits. Pacific Gas and Electric Corp filed for bankruptcy protection. There were claims, and these are civil claims from people who were who were killed, who lost family members and homes and property in this, claiming from uh, PG&E. Reason being, um, it, uh, it's been alleged that it's faults in their electrical distribution equipment that were the ignition source. So that became a wildfire. It had, uh, it was a, a human source, uh, the initiating um, fire. Tree health, subsidence, and windstorm. Uh, changes in climate causing more extreme weather, be it drought or flooding, situations likely to be exacerbated in the future. If we go back to the 2003 heatwave, subsidence claims paid out 390 million compared to a typical year's value of 75 million. So we're talking, you know, over four times the usual annual amount. That's from the Association of British Insurers. The area most affected was Southeast England. It's notorious for having many properties built on clay soil, which makes them uh, particularly susceptible to subsidence. It's an issue that affects thousands of house buyers. Yeah, it's one of the surveys that you might have done, one of the things you might be aware of. It's something you get asked when you uh, sign on for your home property insurance about whether you've had subsidence claims. Usually it's clay soils uh, that are associated with, with claims. Uh, clay is a cohesive soil, so it means the volume varies on each moisture content. So it can expand when it's wet, it can shrink when it's dry. About 75% of UK ground subsidence cases or claims are caused by soil shrinkage. So if you live or work in an area of clay soil, you are, or your assets are at greater risk. Around 60% of subsidence claims are triggered by trees. Doesn't necessarily mean in the context of climate change, and particularly if we relate this back to, to water movement, that sand and gravel uh, soils, uh, the non-cohesive ones, are going to be safe because they don't vary in size depending on water content, but they can be relatively soft and easily affected or washed out, washed away by um, flash flooding yeah, and scouring around bridges, assets, infrastructure, things like that. Moving on to the trees themselves, there is the distinct possibility if they cannot get sufficient water, even if they spread their roots and effectively suck the soil dry. If a tree can't get sufficient water, it stops photosynthesizing. It then does what? The human body does and starts to use its stored food. If this runs out before the drought ends, the tree will start to die. Um, one way it effectively protects itself is to start dropping limbs off, so you start to see structural failure. Obviously, depending on the tree's location, this may present a risk to people, property nearby. German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture estimates the damages caused by the 2018 drought affected millions of trees and at least two and a half thousand kilometres squared need to be reforested. So what might this mean for, for you guys? Do you, do you have a clear understanding of current risk if you've got land uh, that has trees, if you have assets built on clay soils? Have you mapped those out? Have you cross-referenced them with property damage or claims from third parties? Can you detect any spikes following um, spells of dry weather? Do you do periodic tree inspections? Do you know what you've got? Have you got a proactive program of tree maintenance in high risk areas? Do you have access to expert guidance to help you with the investigation of subsidence? Some of you may have attended uh, my colleague Naomi's session on tree risk management a few weeks ago with Staffordshire Branch. Her presentation includes uh, more detail on sensible risk management for tree risk. So if you haven't seen that, it is available as a, a recording and I think um, some of the presentations uh, available too. So one of the ones I, I talked about, one of the risks I talked about uh, right at the beginning was temperature increases. 10 warmest years on record have all been since 1990. And we've got the, uh, the little map there is the two degrees and four degrees uh, scenario planning for what it will mean for the UK. 
Okay, that's that's the average two and four degrees, which means less in some areas, more in others. So we're possibly seeing what's been predicted is, is maybe a duration of heat waves increasing from an average of five days at the moment to 11 days. You know, so more than twice as long with a lot greater frequency, possibly every other year from around 2040. So, you know, the scenarios I described just now, my holiday, for example, it being every other year. And it starts to show how connected things are like temperature rise, water shortages, subsidence, wildfire. So, you know, think about where your staff are deployed at the moment. Are they working outdoors? Yeah, particularly if they are in remote locations, they've got poor access, possibly to shelter, water, food, things like that. Think about the availability of fresh air that is below the ambient temperature. So either your outdoors, meaning the wind typically, or indoor ventilation or air conditioning, climate control. Think about when do people work? Yeah, have you got shifts? Yeah, are they, are they going to be more exposed than other? colleagues at different times of the day and also think about you know how do you feel you think about the last heat wave what did it do to your own sleep patterns do you sleep well when it's really hot at night or are you tossing and turning and kicking the sheets off and waking up feeling like it wasn't much point going to bed yeah and again health and safety you know it's kind of basic stuff around human factors behavioral safety again is going to have an impact you know, perhaps you've seen quite a lot of information and interest at the moment around fatigue risk management uh, and sleep deprivation and what that does to people. And um, sort of describing that and, and making an analogy with lack of sleep to having too much alcohol, a very similar effect on our responses and our alertness. The 15,000 fatalities in France were primarily in the Paris area, and it was a lot of elderly people in, um, in the upper um, levels of um, houses of multiple occupation, it's often associated with a lack of thermal insulation in the roofs um, and an inability for them to sort of respond and adapt their behavior, such as dressing lightly uh, and using cooling techniques and devices. There's been a bit of a shift away, despite the cleaner air when nobody was traveling, there's been a bit of a reluctance for people to get back on buses and, uh, and trains and things like that. The independent newspaper in 2019 um, did some checks on temperature on seven of the London Underground lines um, in the summer, and seven of them, sorry, uh, exceeded 30 degrees Celsius, the highest was 33.4. So you might be, that's okay, I'll just go on the bus. Um, so they made some checks there. It was 33 degrees on the top of a double-decker bus. We also need to think about some of the wider aspects around heat gain within buildings, possibly affecting cold water systems and Legionella pro proliferation, and also uh, food contamination, food spoiling if temperatures go up. So wide, wide range of risks potentially associated. With it there. And it's worth just having uh, a read of this from, uh, from the new year. Doesn't really need much explanation from me, does it? This one. And air quality, as I said, not necessarily directly related to climate change, but I think it's, you know, there are some parallels here. It's one that's often sort of put around as a public health issue, uh, but I think in a lot of cases, it's going to be an employee health and safety issue uh, as well. So, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone gases irritate the airways of the lungs. Yeah, particularly increasing symptoms of those suffering from lung diseases. Fine particles make their way into deep into the lungs, into the respiratory system, causing uh, inflammation and a worsening of heart and lung diseases. 
Some of these particles can uh, include a wide range of hazardous substances, including metals, metal fume. Carbon monoxide prevents the uptake of oxygen into the blood. This can lead to a significant reduction in the supply of oxygen to the heart, particularly affecting those who already have heart disease. Some medical conditions are going to be particularly affected by this, as I've mentioned, but there's also issues around general health factors, uh, high body mass index, uh, high blood pressure, and also lifestyle choices such as tobacco use or physical fitness. You'll know that the HSE um, have a particular focus on respiratory occupational hazards. And what I'm talking about here mainly is background uh, pollution background air quality rather than um, respiratory uh, hazards that are generated specifically by the work that someone does. Um, we can't assume that the protection that we put in place for occupational sources are going to protect people from the background sources. Yeah, if we take this you know, the example of PPE or respiratory protective equipment, just because it protects possibly against particulates doesn't mean it's going to protect against gases. Yeah, so again, we need to think of that a little bit deeply, more deeply um, with our cost risk assessments and our PPE risk assessment. And again, think about your staff profile. Yeah, who's working outdoors um, or in a building with lots of natural ventilation, things like drive throughs yeah, garages, um, where the background air pollution could be higher. Yeah, so vehicle drivers, road workers, drive throughs garages, police officers, paramedics, crossing patrols, cycle couriers, ground maintenance staff, telecoms, utility engineers, refuse collections, construction workers. But as I said at the beginning, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all bad. Most people are breathing a bit of a sigh of relief from the disruption. Uh, of COVID, but as we keep knowing and being told, it's not over yet. But it did show us just how quickly um, the world, and particularly the air, can uh, restore itself and clean up. Um, in May of 2020, global carbon dioxide emissions have dropped by an estimated 17%. To reach the Paris Agreement, we need a drop of 7.6% year on year. But it does show that where there is a will, where we've got a concentrated effort, a concerted effort, it is possible to affect change on a global scale. The European Respiratory Journal commented in February and March 2020, cities all over the world are observing record low levels of air pollution. Ambient levels of nitrogen oxide, one of the main traffic related pollutants, Declined by 70 to 80 percent in Barcelona, 40 percent in London, 50 percent in New York. It didn't last long enough, really, for us to know whether that was going to result in significant health benefits. Yeah, that remains to be seen, but it does show that it is possible to abate air pollution. Communities that are educated and engaged more easily adhere to and are involved in prevention and treatment measures. But this will depend on infrastructures, institutions, and resources that are made available. So this graphic came from uh, the British Medical Journal, just sort of shows you know, how some of these things are, are related. And I think I draw your attention to the bit along the bottom there, the health benefits. Some of you may have a well-being uh, angle to the work that you do for health and safety as well. So, yeah, health benefits, better mental health, fewer deaths from extreme heat, the example we've just seen from uh, the US, less cardiovascular disease, possibly because people are more active, but also from better quality environmental conditions, less respiratory disease, similarly related to air pollution, typically. Maybe lower rates of cancer as well, lower rates of obesity. So there are a lot of benefits uh, from making some of these changes.
So what does this mean for us? So the title of this was climate change and air pollution implications for health, safety and liability. What about the implications for health and safety practitioners? Yeah, us. The second point was about leveraging our relationships with other professionals. So there might be a role in mitigating climate change on worker health and safety or third party health and safety from human resources, thinking about possibly sustainable transport initiatives for workers, from learning and development awareness and campaigns to support sustainability and climate action. Facilities management, buildings, and building service design, energy sources, energy efficiency, and energy supplier choices. Transport and highways, switching to electric vehicles, highway design to encourage working, walking and cycling. Emergency planning, building resilience and responses that are safer for workers and communities who are caught up in climate change um, uh, uh, effects. And your insurance and risk teams, linking strategic climate change risks to operational impacts, the sorts of things that I've run through with you today. So I believe firmly that as health and safety practitioners, that we will have to assess, manage and control some of the risks that I've spoken about this afternoon. These risks will impact people. That may not be most of the focus at the moment, but you know, let's not kid ourselves. It will impact people. No doubt about that. Yeah, it's going to affect our own health and that of our families, our colleagues, our customers. But I think health and safety practitioners are ideally placed to use their expertise, skill, judgment to help your employers and your communities respond and mitigate these, just as we always do. Well, some of these things seem too big for sort of individual action, but again, I don't think that's true. And we might be thinking, you know, and hopefully I've, I've maybe changed your mind if it needed changing, that this isn't part of your job, but it, it is. We're all about helping people to respond and cope to situations, and we are influencers. Yeah, most of the time, you know, we're not able to change operations or choose buildings and all the rest of it, but we can influence. Yeah, we tend to be curious and tenacious, and they're good skills to have. Yeah, in how we help our employers and customers transition to a more sustainable way of working. As I mentioned, one thing we're not lacking in is data. So uh, I've selected a few uh, websites, um, so information, various tools for assessing risk and, and guidance on risk management, risk mitigation. So here's a few that I think you may find useful. Um, as I said, I'll, I will share uh, these slides. Um, and there's a few more scattered through the presentation as well. So much to my surprise, I'm pretty much on time. So just suffice to say that is the end of my presentation, except for a completely shameless plug for uh, Zurich Resilience Solutions, and in particular, our climate change resilient services. There's a link there. Uh, but you know, either reach out through the ZRS website, or uh, if you'd like, always happy to take um, uh, fellow practitioners uh, as, um, as links on LinkedIn. Uh, so do reach out to me if you want to know more. So thank you very much, so much for your attention. I hope you found it useful and informative. So um, I think we've got time for some questions. Yeah, we've just got two questions um, and um, they're from Fletcher, um, who hails from Australia. Um, so he's got two questions. First one is, we are seeing extreme weather conditions in Australia. Despite the issues and drama of extreme weather, we are not seeing a reaction to climate change. What can we do to convince policymakers to review policies and risk? Do you mean with as a profession, Fletcher? And Glad you could join us. Fletcher, happy happy for you to take the stage. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about us as a, as a profession, I think that's that's one for the professional bodies. You know, I think IOSH, you know, has a voice, um, certainly for, for the UK government. It has a, you know, it has some global reach, um, you know, and I think it, you know, it does have, Policy. I'm not sure whether it's got much on, on, on this side of things, on the, on the health and safety um, uh, side of climate change. But yeah, I think that's definitely room. 
as an insurer, Zurich also has uh, tries to influence government. It's 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 one of sort of aspects of, of what insurers do. Uh, and Zurich tries to be very active. I don't know if you, know, if you follow us on um, on LinkedIn, you perhaps picked up some of our our actions um, as trying to sort of improve our sustainability where we invest um, the sort of um, businesses that we will and will not invest in that uh, you know have an impact and I think that's one of the key things um, is our economic muscle um, you know it, where we choose to invest where we choose to buy um, and all those sorts of things I think that's that's definitely one way we can we can do it that's brilliant. Um, second question was going on from my first question. How can the businesses I'm conducting adapt to these extreme weather events, for example, insurances and risk? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so shameless plug. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, that we we do offer. We have a lot of experience and a lot of data around certainly around geographic risks, natural hazards, uh, and things. And we are. Uh, we, or we do work with our customers on, on the natural hazard side of things. So we sort of add what we know about particular locations in, term, in terms of their vulnerabilities and putting that together with climate data to try and predict um, what might change for an existing uh, site. Uh, if you're looking at acquisition uh, or divestments and things like that, then it can help sort of manage those risks from a due diligence point of view. Um, I think the transition risks and the, the bit that sort of health and safety falls into is, is arguably a bit less um, definite. Uh, you know, I think it, as ever, risk assessment is, is the key. You know, if we are starting to get the data and some of it is, um, I think, a good way, a useful way of doing it is what I've tried to do today is sort of use scenarios. Yeah. It, just so I said, you know, imagine, you know, if things are difficult in a heat wave, what's that going to mean when that's every year instead of every five years? And I, I know, Fletcher, you're talking from Australia, so um, you're probably thinking, what does the UK know about a heat wave? But hopefully you, you kind of get my point. Yeah, if these things are happening more often, if you just think of, you know, basic risk matrix, likelihood and severity, yeah, if it's happening more often, it's more likely. If it's getting hotter, severity is high yeah we've seen that uh, the case study from the states where a chap basically died of heat exhaustion yeah so i think risk assessment really is the key um but it's going to be you know a, a big deal it's going to in also include you know things like the sorts of buildings that we select um the investments in better insulation uh, that decision about whether we um use more electricity to drive climate uh, controls within buildings to rate to lower the temperature so there's all sorts of um of interrelationships but i think you know as health and safety professionals you know we're really well placed to do that it's, it's kind of our bread and butter isn't it assessing risk and, and looking at the complexity yeah. that's brilliant thank you very much um i i don't think we've got any more questions um so we'll hand over to bernard to close us out thank you liz Thank you, David, for very informative and insightful presentation. And thank you for supporting the Staffordshire branch and EHS practitioners all over the world, basically. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending, for collaborating with us today. And also thank you to Staffordshire committee members for organizing and supporting the EHS uh, profession. Before I close out the meeting, I would like to remind that uh, this session has been recorded and it will be available on IOSH YouTube channel. The slides will be available all on Staffordshire branch LinkedIn uh, page as a PDF format. And everyone will also receive a feedback survey from IOSH. So uh, we ask you to complete this because this is a great opportunity to understand your expectation and for the branch for continuous improvement. So thank you everyone again. Have a good afternoon, have a good weekend and see you shortly. Bye-bye. Thank you everybody, bye-bye.